guys to another episode of quarantine chats episode 34 we got a special guest here jordan wong uh from hawaii goes to the other osu oregon state who happened to play uh ohio state in my senior year week one so uh go ahead and introduce yourself jordan hey uh first off i want to say thank you for having me you know i, I really yeah, appreciate sure, it man yeah so uh you know just give it a little bit about myself uh like Steven said, I'm Jordan Wong. Uh, you know, right now I'm a trainer for a local basketball company called Taki Fit. You can look them up on Instagram. You know, they got a little bit of a following. I think about 135,000 right now. So, you know, I've been doing that for about five years, just trying to help the youth out here, you know, figure out their dreams, whether it involves basketball or dunking or anything involving that field. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm involved in right now. For sure, for sure, man. So um, how's the whole situation with basketball coaching been at, during this COVID-19 crisis? You know, it's been, um, there's been some low moments for sure. But for the most part, um, I, I personally think it's a blessing in disguise. Partly because the youth nowadays, like, there's so much basketball they're doing. And they're constantly running, never really giving themselves much of a break. And so, you know, the COVID-19, uh, as un unfortunate as it is, you know, I think there's a silver lining that kids are getting healthier and they're able to get better at home and try to learn how to work hard by themselves rather than with uh, trainers and other people around them. So I think that's a, some good things we can take from this terrible world crisis. Yeah, and you know, one more thing is kids getting locked in at home, and this applies to me as well, they can't hit up those fast foods as much, you know, McDonald's, Big Macs, <laughs> I know the to-go is open, but you know, it ain't the same when it's to-go restaurants only, you know, they're staying off the deep fried food, they're eating a bit healthier at home. I agree, I agree, and I think that family dynamic there, a lot of these children are finally getting is really going to help their development too, because, you know, video games are children's lives for the most part so i think being home yeah i don't think their parents are going to let them be on as much as they used to yeah yeah so fun fact jordan wong goes to oregon state he's isaiah's friend from hawaii uh the other guest here on trevor who is a staple guest of our show he's always filling in when we need a guest with strong opinions he's clutches for us he actually first met me at the week one Ohio State versus Oregon State, OSU versus OSU battle back in 2018. Trevor, what'd you think about that football game? It was a great game. Like you said, Ohio State was going to start out slow, but we were a second half team and it just showed and just dominated from there on out. Wasn't that game a rain game too? Like later? like it, Yeah, yeah, that game was, was rained out, man. It, uh, it got so bad that. that in the middle they had to stop the game for the rain delay and we were all huddled in uh, inside the little dome structure and kind of like talking and interacting with each other. No, I stayed outside in the rain and I saw someone Ooh. gave the OH right on the block and he was able to get back in the stands. It was crazy. <laughs> Dude, it was such an interesting experience. There's a couple things that happened in that game. I don't want to take up the whole podcast to get into it. But uh, so the first thing was, I met Trevor at this Oregon State, Ohio State game. And the second funny thing was um, when I was talking to my, the Oregon State fans, I was always going OH to them and, you know, going up to them and saying, hey, so what school is this? And they'd be like, Oregon State. I'm like, really? With the terrible football you're playing, I thought you were the Caltech Beavers, not the Oregon State Beavers. Same color, same football brand, same kind of play. And, man, they, they booed me like crazy. Like, I became public enemy number one, man. Jordan – your favorite basketball player was Katie. I was probably hated more than Katie in that stadium for saying that stuff. 
The other thing was I actually got to talking to some of these Oregon State fans and I asked them why they took the trip all the way from Oregon because most of them came from Oregon all the way to Ohio, cross-country trip. And they told me the reason why is because our stadium is so amazing. Like they've never been in a structure and an environment like that before where you got over 100,000 fans on any given Saturday huddled up just cheering on that Buckeye faithful. Yeah, man, I mean... The difference is I've never been to that stadium, but for definitely going to Oregon State Stadium, it's definitely a different dynamic, I'm sure, you know, and uh, I, (laughs) you, you yelling at those uh, or telling those Oregon State (laughs) fans, uh, the Cal, Cal Caltech thing is really funny because they, uh, they have so much pride in their team, man, like Oregon State fans. I don't, if you've ever been to the area, there's nothing around there. There's nothing. <laughs> and so, so it's like another Hawaii football. Sort of, but it's a little bit more. There's definitely some more vigor in how they approach their sports. Like they really take pride in it. And uh, it's a bummer when they're not good. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I was just kind of trolling there, you know. Young, young adult just having his f- fair share of fun over there. But yeah, it was a, definitely a really good experience uh, seeing Oregon State come down. Hopefully sometime we'll be able to play the other, other OSU, Oklahoma State. Yeah, All well, right. They'll give you a m- much more of a fight than we did. <laughs> All right. So let's dive into our first topic, guys. We're going to get into some basketball and then some football later on. So First, we're going to talk about Isaiah's Lakers. And Isaiah has a very, very interesting theory about this whole coronavirus situation and how it relates to the LA Lakers and the Boston Celtics. You guys are going to love this for everyone tuning in. We got a poll down below that says, do you believe that the Lakers were the best team this season? You know, before COVID struck, go ahead and vote in that poll. I think they were. They were definitely poised to win that title with LeBron James, that elusive 17th championship and LeBron's fourth overall together. It was going to be an epic playoffs, and I hope it comes back. But first, let me get into that theory. Isaiah's theory is that this whole coronavirus was invented in the Boston labs to prevent the Lakers from winning that elusive 17th championship to match the city of Boston, to match the Boston Celtics. Wow, that's... uh trying to process it right now you know i think um they definitely have enough hate for the laker faithful to (laughs) think of something like that but i you know i i hope i hope that's not what happened (laughs) yeah i mean to speak up for everyone here besides isaiah obviously um we do not advocate this opinion i don't think the coronavirus was invented in the boston lab to prevent the lakers from winning another title but I need Isaiah here to speak up about his opinion. Man, that is one radical take. You get, you have any way to justify yourself? Uh, I'll just say this. You know, I'll just say that the reason why I said it was because the Lakers are clearly the more dominant team to Boston. Because if you look at both teams, there is no way that the Celtics were going to get past the Bucks to win the to win the NBA championship. And I thought that in the Western Conference, I just thought that the Lakers, you know, they had just hit, like, yeah, they had just started to hit their stride. And they beat Milwaukee, they beat the Clippers, and they were just turning into this really big monster that I really don't think anybody could have stopped. So it just sucks that the season got postponed. Okay. Trevor, you always deal a lot with Isaiah's troll opinions. How far-fetched is this one? This one's pretty far out there compared to his fantasy with Devin Booker coming to LA. That that one's it's possible, but I think this one is beyond that spectrum of saying that the Boston Labs created the coronavirus. It's <laughs> next to impossible. It's like if you're a Boston fan, you would just focus on the team and not get in the entire world sick. So yeah, that's where I stand on that. So it was like more of like, oh, they lock LeBron James in his house. He can't get to the games, something like that. But I could see Boston fans doing something like that. Yeah, all of it is pretty far fetched, but pretty funny theory, Isaiah. But let's actually get into it's you know, kind of the like real... a, it's kind of like a game of zones 
episode. You know, I could seriously see like the. I can actually see that. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, yeah. the like the White Walkers or like the uh, like Cersei Lannister Empire. They invent some kind of virus to like take down the Kingdom of LA. Be, that, that sounds like such a like medieval slash game of zones vibe but let's get into the meat of the topic here and that is really was were the lakers the best team in the league at the time of the virus and were they poised to make that title run uh for anyone who disagrees with that who thinks no um this is kind of your chance to speak up yeah well for me i'm gonna before I get into that, um, were the Lakers the best team in the NBA question, I'm going to go to your question about, like, what grade would you give Frank Vogel, the Lakers head coach, for, like, the job that he did this season? And I am going to give him an A for the job that he did because, um, you know, I, I know he was blessed with so, so much talent on his team. I get that. But – I think Frank Vogel did an outstanding job in getting the team to come together and buy into his system. You know, it was well documented how the Lakers completely bungled their head coaching search last season after Luke Walton and them most uh, mutually parted ways. And he was their number three choice. They wanted Monty Williams. They didn't. Uh, he chose the Phoenix Suns over the Lakers, which sounds really sad. And then. They also wanted Tyron Liu, but he like the Lakers lowballed him and he bailed on them. So they had to settle for Vogel. The players could have completely shut him out and just ignored him since they knew he was not really wanted. But Frank Vogel got them to buy into his offensive and defensive philosophy and systems. And the Lakers were defending at a really high level this year, which is unlike what we've seen from Lakers teams in the past. And which is also what is uh, what Vogel is known for as a coach. His only flaw, however, is the lack of development of Kyle Kuzma. You know, Kyle Kuzma was supposed to have his breakout year this year and be that third guy of the big three, but he has struggled mightily this season. But other than that, I would say great job by Frank Vogel. That's why I'll give him like an A minus. Yeah, so he, he dove into both topics here. Number one, were the Lakers the best team in the league? at the time of the coronavirus? And number two, kind of what grade do you give Frank Vogel on this NBA season? Um, yeah, I think you made really good points there, Isaiah. I think, you know, traditionally, we all know that LeBron James trios have always inv um, involved the big man taking a back seat in terms of that offensive role within the team. Chris Bosh, Kevin Love. And then even in Cleveland, um, before the Cleveland team that won the title, like Anderson Verjao, big men were always kind of the offensive, like backdrop to LeBron's system. They were never really part of the main offensive system, the machine, but Frank Vogel really found a way to maximize Anthony Davis, AD, which is not an uh, easy thing to do. Cause you know, you might look at Anthony Davis and you're like, man, this guy's a superstar. He's a stud. Like you could make the argument right now. And I certainly wouldn't agree with it, but you could make the argument that it's at this point in their careers, Anthony Davis is better than Steph Curry and LeBron James. There's that argument to be made. But still, it, it, it's tough to get a player who is a perennial championship contender, who basically is the NBA Finals in LeBron, to shift from, you know, a guard-dominant system where he dominates the floor with the guard to now, like, maximizing the talent of, of a big man alongside him. So to, to, to kind of the co-star be a center – that's really, really good job by Frank Vogel. And that's why I think LA is definitely um, the best team in the league. And I get Frank Vogel an A minus because he had a lot of talent to work with, but I think um, to expect him to integrate it so quickly um, is definitely something that's not, not so easy. Oh yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think, um, you know, if, LeBron has never really worked with coaches well in general. I think the only one he really worked well with was Tyron Liu. And I think that's because Tyron Liu really had a good grasp of that locker room from him playing back in the day too. And I think typically players respect coaches who play. But uh, Vogel had a lot of help too with Lionel Hollins and having Jason Kidd as an assistant coach. But, um, you know, the buy-in that they got – as a team to play good defensive basketball 
is something I haven't seen since 2009 and 2010 with the Lakers when Kobe was in his prime, right? And so I think just off of that, you have to give Vogel credit for it. But, um, you know, I, I, I truly think that LA was the best team going um, into the end of the year. And I think Frank Vogel had a big part to play in that because he really, he really brought the team together without putting too much control on them to where LeBron wouldn't be uh, agreeing with what he's saying or how he's coaching. I think they found the perfect balance this year. And it's unfortunate we didn't get to see it play out. So final grade for Frank Vogel on this season, as it's turned out so far, what would you give it from A plus to F? I think you would have to give it either an A minus or higher. Me personally. Yeah, definitely. I would say an A, definitely. Yeah, I think it's just real easy to say and look at some of these like championship winning head coaches like Steve Kerr and Frank Vogel, right? Because you have your like Phil Jackson and Greg Popoviches who are just staple, um, powerful and excellent head coaches who always win no matter what the talent is and, and, and really turn like superstar talent into championship winning talent. But then you have like the next tier, right? It's real a- easy to look at like a Frank Vogel or a Steve Kerr and say like, well, look at the talent they had. Of course they should win these games. Like uh, you have Clay Thompson, Steph Curry, Draymond Green. In the Lakers case, you have LeBron James, Anthony Davis. Like if you're not winning games, what are you doing? Like any mediocre head coach can win a couple games with LeBron James, the greatest small forward of all time. And then Anthony Davis, the top five all-time center and top five player right now. But I think that just obviously ignores the fact that number one, LeBron James systems have always featured guard dominate and forward dominant play. The big man has never been the main co-star. It's always been that Kevin Love, Chris Bosh, Anderson Barajal, they take the back seat offensively. So for him to really run the team and Frank Vogel, like you said, to run that hands-off approach and they are able to combine that superstar tandem such that AD is now like the main co-star and arguably the main star of the LA offensive system, that is no small feat. And then the second thing is the value of incremental wins. A lot of people like to make the argument like, well, like, you know, this guy took this team from 26 wins to like 54. This other guy took it from 60 wins to 70 wins. This is kind of like basic probability in math. The higher and higher you get, the harder it is. Like from 54 to 55 wins is a much tougher accomplishment than to go from 14 to 15 wins. The wins get more and more hard to add on as you go higher in the record. So going from like, say like a 55 win team to a 65 win team is equally as difficult from like 26 to 52. Cause as you go higher, it gets tougher. So that's why I definitely give them an A minus or higher. I'm going to stick with an A minus because LeBron is practically a player coach, but Vogel deserves his fair share. All right, I'm going to go to Trevor now. Well, looking at this conversation, there's many different ways of taking it. The Lakers are going strong at the beginning of the year and life was going good for them. And like you could say, it was LeBron because he, he knows how to coach players and how to be a field general on the court. And then, like, the coach obviously added some more features to it. But after the death of Kobe, I think that was, like, the turn-on switch is be like, we got to go out and try to win this title. So there's more of, like, you try to find ways to work with the coach and all that. So if you take away the death of Kobe, I think the season could have been a little bit more different. But since you had that in there, it was like saying, we got to win this for the community of L.A. and try to figure out whatever it takes to win that title. So it's hard for me to say, yes, it's an A minus, but it's like close. I would probably say like it's like an 89% on the cusp of it because of the death of Kobe. And, you know, you can fluctuate between those and how you choose to view it. And were the Lakers the best team in the league before the virus hit? They were definitely the best team in the league because like you had a lot of chemistry. LeBron James was healthy and had a lot of pieces to get a title out of that team. And the only few roadblocks that they would end up going against is probably be the Clippers before they even got to the finals. That'd probably be like their one roadblock. But after they got through that, 
they, they probably could win the finals in like five, maybe six games. It depends who they end up going against. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned something about um, Kobe Bryant's death really fueling this team forward and, you know, ramping up that pressure to win for Kobe. So I got to ask Jordan from a, you know, coaching perspective, how much do you think motivation such as like outside of the actual game of basketball, so like not on the actual court, but like a death of a loved one or maybe like some kind of hardship a coach is going through really motivates a team because you can't take a team of like junior, junior varsity players that are way below average and expect them to have a winning record because now they have some magical motivation. Similarly, you can't take a team of like Mo Williams, Kevin Love, and like Delonte West and expect to win like 82 games just because Kobe died, right? So how much do you think that motivation added on to this talented Lakers team? Like how much does it really affect that performance? I mean, it, it certainly gave more purpose to the whole year as a whole. And in, I mean, as a coach, there's a lot of dynamics that go on with the team. Um, a lot of people are still trying to find their role, even towards the end of the year on the team. And I think with Kobe dying, it really gave everyone on that Lakers team like, hey, you know what? We, we all have to be an all-star in whatever role we play. And we got to win this for Kobe, you know? Win and for so Kobe. I think – Having having Kobe go as unfortunate as it was, I think we got to witness, um, you know, the best Lakers team we've ever seen. Honestly, as a whole, since the Magic and Kareem days, really, or actually, well, what am I talking about with Matt, with Shaq and Kobe? I mean, they're the duel of LeBron and AD this year was really hard to stop, and I think. Kobe going only through more fuel onto that fire for them to win this year's championship. Yeah. Well said. I, I would argue that this Lakers team could be stronger than that Shaq Kobe Lakers team, because the one issue that happened with that team was, you know, obviously the chemistry, but also in terms of playing the games, Kobe and Shaq were riddled with injury history. And that duo never really got to reach its full potential where it's like, oh, they're contending to be a 73 and nine champion. Whereas I feel like this LA team could actually consistently win 60 plus games and multiple titles. But um, just from the regular season results, we can't tell how great of a team this will end up being. But I think it has the great potential to be better than that Shaq Kobe dynamic. Mainly yeah. because of the agility of Anthony Davis and being able to play more games total. So then their win loss is going to be stronger. Totally agree. Yeah. Another thing I got to give Vogel credit for is I really need to give Vogel credit for getting the players to buy into their respective roles. Like you look at a guy like Dwight Howard, who has had multiple all-star appearances. He's got a lot of accolades that he's earned in his career. And he basically just took a step back and was like, hey, guys, I'm willing to take the minimum contract to play for you guys to go trade chase a championship and I'm willing to come off the bench like Dwight Howard you know he couldn't he didn't have to do that he could have just you know um demanded a starter's job or whatever but he chose to you know come to LA and settle for a bench role which you know I thought was incredible so if the season were to resume guys and great point by the way Isaiah about Dwight Howard really taking that backup center role with grace but if this season were to resume, is all of your guys' pick to win the title, the Los Angeles Lakers? Yeah, for me, yeah. I'm going to go with the Lakers because I know the like the Clippers might be our primary foe that we're going to have to get past in the Western Conference Finals. But I saw something in that Lakers-Clippers game, the, the last one before the season uh, unfortunately got shut down, that really um, surprised me, and that was – Kawhi Leonard, uh, this was, I think, in the tail end of the game when the Clippers really needed a stop. Kawhi Leonard, I feel like, is scared of LeBron James. Because if you look at it, and at that point, the tail end of the game, the Clippers really needed a stop. Instead of guarding, like saying, you know what, I'm going to not let LeBron score, and 
I'm going to, you know, give us an opportunity to come back. Kawhi Leonard was guarding Danny Green instead of LeBron James. LeBron James went up against, I think, Jamichael Green. He drove past him, and then Kawhi was there, like underneath the basket to help. But instead of helping, he moves away. So I thought Kawhi Leonard uh, feared LeBron James from like what I saw in that. And I just think that, you know, if they had matchup in the playoffs, I just think LeBron was, would have been a beast. And then I don't think there's anybody on the Clippers that can stop AD in the paint. Nobody. I mean, it's so interesting because you usually hear the opposite narrative. And that's because LeBron James is the prohibitive best player in the NBA in this generation. And so everybody's always hating on LeBron and saying he's afraid of Kawhi. It's pretty funny to hear the opposite perspective. But honestly, like, and I'm sure Jordan understands this as an athlete and Trevor as a former athlete. I think when you get to that level of athletics, it could be anything, tennis, gymnastics, basketball, football. You are not afraid of anyone. You expect to be the best. You even aim to be the greatest of all time. Like there's no way in hell, Isaiah, I don't care like what kind of isolations or switches were happening throughout the game. There's no way in hell that Kawhi or LeBron are afraid of each other. When you're that competent in basketball, you don't doubt yourself. You don't second guess yourself. It's just not a thing. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Steven. I think, I think at that level where, I mean, LeBron, he was the chosen one. You know, he, he's probably the most hype athlete ever, and he lived up to that hype and more. And so I think at that level, I don't think fear plays really that much. Yeah, nobody part. gives a shit, man. <laughs> Excuse my language. But, yeah, but yeah I mean, if you're, if you're as good as Kawhi Leonard or even Paul George, dude, and you don't expect to be the best or possibly even the greatest of all time, like, what are you even doing in the league when oh. you're that good at your sport and you've put in 10,000 hours of dribbling practice, 10,000 hours of three points, 10,000 hours of free throw, and you don't expect to be the best someday, you're really in the wrong league. All these players believe in themselves, Isaiah. So while I love the hot take and I kind of hate the hot take that LeBron's afraid of Kawhi from other people, I just, you know, I don't, I, I don't buy into it. I don't think any player is afraid of anyone unless they're down by 80 points. All right, <laughs> let's move into another LA sport, USC football. Isaiah, this season, which team and going forward will be the better football team, USC or Notre Dame? Ooh. Um, Jordan's probably going to hate me for saying this because he's a huge Notre Dame fan, but I think both of these teams are going to have pretty good success next season. But I got to give it to the USC Trojans just because I think that with the way their quarterback, Keaton Slovis, is playing, I have a feeling, and with their schedule being really easy because the Pac-12 is wide open, I think the USC Trojans are going to go to the playoffs next season. I really do. Like, if you break it down, um, coaching, obviously coaching, you You've got to give it to Notre Dame because Brian Kelly over Clay Helton all day, every day. There's like, there's no debate about that. Um, offense, USC, I would give that to USC because uh, USC's offense was so prolific last season. Their quarterback, Keaton Slovis, as I mentioned before, you know, he played 12 games. He was, he completed 282 passes for, and uh, missed, yeah, 282 for 392 71.9 completion percentage. He has a really strong arm. He goes through his progressions. He's a great leader. He's just, he's very athletic. He just does things that you typically never see from a freshman. That's why I think this kid will be really special in the future. Um, he was doing this kind of things in his freshman year of college. He's going to get even better in a second year under Granham Harrell's offensive scheme and with more development, and plus they've got really good running backs, receivers, tight ends, offensive line. Um, the thing about Notre Dame's offense is, yes, they have Ian Book, but their offense, I wouldn't say they were like, they weren't really that good last year, and they have a new play caller on offense in Tommy Reese. So with that, like with the questions about how, what Tommy Reese is going to do, the uncertainty of that, I'm going to give it to USC 
I think defensively, you got to give it to Notre Dame because USC's their main weakness last year. The thing that really held them back was defense because, like, they had the worst defense in college football. Uh, they changed coordinators. Uh, they ha- they hired Todd Orlando, who's a really fiery coach. Um, I don't know how much he's going to bring into the – like, how much he's going to help USC's defense because of this whole COVID-19 pandemic like they can't practice so you can't really implement your schemes right now um, which I think will really hurt them and the schedule I USC they don't have to face Clemson or Michigan or anything like that they just have to go through like teams like Washington who I believe will take a step back because their coach retired Uh, their quarterback is gone and then you have uh, Colorado their coach is gone too Arizona, their coach is on the hot seat. They just lost their quarterback. And the only team they really got to go through in the Pac-12 that is going to pose a challenge for them is Oregon. But their quarterback is gone too. And I don't know how their um, incoming quarterback is. So I believe I would say USC over Notre Dame. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to go USC for the same reason. I just think that overall USC is the rising program And Notre Dame, while iconic and having the brand name to really generate four-star and five-star recruit talent, and they've been continuing to get these recruits out there, I just think USC has now become the more well-oiled machine, believe it or not, with Keaton Slovis. When you have, and I'm going to go back to my previous point, when you have a guy like JT Daniels, right, who's played football for so long, transferring out of USC because of Keaton, this guy who came in as a backup freshman and just really lit up the Pac-12, that shows you that Keaton is a really special talent because a guy like JT Daniels, who works so hard to get to the point where he's the starting quarterback of USC. If he's getting the hell out of there, that's telling me that he really doesn't think that he has even an inkling of a chance of being the starter of USC anymore. And you can kind of get the idea of how good Keaton's got to be in order for that to happen. So I'm going to keep it simple here. I'm going to keep it USC over Notre Dame. Go to uh, Jordan. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I, I as much as it pains me to say it, USC is definitely the program on the rise right now compared to Notre Dame. I think um, USC has the third uh, ranked recruiting class for 2021 right now, I believe. And I think Notre Dame is actually 10. I think one spot in front of Minnesota right now, surprisingly. But um I think USC will definitely have the better year just because of their strength of schedule. Now, I don't know if they're going to go to the playoff just because that strength of schedule is a double-edged sword in terms of how the committee is going to look at whether Mm -hmm. or not the competition they played is going to be good enough compared to maybe like Alabama or Clemson or maybe even Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan. There's so many other teams that, you know, you are going to be on that bubble. And if USC isn't undefeated, I don't think they're going to get in there personally. But um, probably not. I think Notre Dame, you know, they it's good. I'm very happy we have Ian Book, but we're really going to miss that downfield threat that Claypool provided. Uh, Gilman in our secondary is a really big loss. Um, so we're going to need to fill those spots. But I think I'm going to have to agree with you guys that USC is um, definitely the program on the rise. But um, the one thing you got to look out for, we might not have games in the normal time of the schedule. So they might have to go play in cold weather. And now I don't know if those California boys are ready for that because Mm. some some places they go get really cold. And if you're not used to playing in that type of weather, I mean, your fingers are going to be frozen. Your legs are going to be heavy. And I think that's truly going to play a big part in how well West Coast teams play this upcoming football year. Yeah, Yeah, um, Jordan said exactly the same thing. What our guest that we had last week, Solomon Maltautia said, the former Hawaii linebacker, when Hawaii went into Boise, the reason why they got blown out was because um, they were so used to practicing in 80 degree weather. And then when they went to Boise, it was a complete shock to them to be playing in 40 degree weather with the snow coming down. So that was um, one of the big issues. And another thing I got to say about USC schedule is 
I don't know about the playoffs. I mean, if they if they go undefeated with this schedule, they will definitely get into the playoffs because looking at their schedule right now, they've got Alabama to open the season. That's a gauntlet right there. And then huh, have, that's a no. Yeah, you have at Oregon, and then you've got Notre Dame. So if they go undefeated, there is no way you can't put uh, you can't leave USC out of the playoffs. And the last thing I got to say is. Shout out to you, Keaton Slovis, for giving my boy Stephen Wang yesterday on your live stream a happy birthday. Shout out. It's yeah, so thanks, Keaton. But yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think um, with both of these teams, you're not looking at a playoff contender. The playoff guys are going to be Ohio State, Clemson, and then the two left over. Personally, I think two Big Ten teams are going to get in this year because mm-hmm. I think the SEC is – vastly falling now they have lost in the past two years they have lost Jalen Hurts to Oklahoma and now to the draft they've lost Tua Takovailoa they've lost Joe Burrow they have no clear franchise quarterback to really lead the SEC anymore and have that dominant team Bo Nix is not going to do it Mac Jones I mean I love the guy he's pretty fundamental and he's decently athletic but I don't I don't see him like really contending with an Ohio State so SEC is really going to be the declining conference this year. So that's why I have two big 10 teams going in. So Ohio state and Wisconsin, and then uh, on the PAC 12 side of things, I, I don't see USC getting in and then big 12, you could see a return of Oklahoma. But my point is these two teams, they're not going to be the playoff contenders. I think USC is going to go about nine and three and Notre Dame about eight and four. They're going to be close, but I predict kind of, Notre Dame to have kind of a down year and then USC to have a slightly above average year. Um, they, they got the Keaton and quarterback situation figured out, but they still got more things in the team to refine to compete against the Alabamas um, and consistently compete with the Utahs of the world. All right, Trevor. Yeah. St- Wait, Trevor, before you go, I just want to say one more thing to Steven's point, And that is don't forget about Texas because Oklahoma, yes, they're the big dogs of the, Big 12, but they just lost their quarterback and they just lost their starting running back who transferred to Ohio State. So we don't know who's going to be their quarterback and their uh, running back in their offense this upcoming season. Oh, yeah. Texas would probably be my pick to uh, advance to the playoffs and win the Big 12, by the way. Uh, Isaiah, Sam Ellinger or Keaton Slovis? Oh, I'm just, uh, I'll go with Keaton Slovis because of the arm and the athletic ability. Yeah, he's had a man crush on both, so I just had to ask. <laughs> All right, Trevor, so which team do you see as being the better program this year, USC or Notre Dame? Better program this year. USC, is, I can say, is definitely on the rise. And looking at their schedule, like their only loss, in my opinion, is probably to Alabama first game, getting everyone situated to the system. Like That's probably be like the first thing. But, like, when you look at the two schedules, like, Notre Dame can go, like, for the first four games, can go 4-0 and and ride pretty far. Like, their fifth game is Wisconsin. Then they hit Stanford. So, like, those games are probably going to be ranked in the top 15, top 20 matchup to give them a good boost. And, like, later into the season, it's like they get Clemson. So, if they upset Clemson, now they're in the playoff contention. But if USC loses to Alabama, they don't really have a shot at getting into the playoffs unless they basically win the conference, but they have to go with one loss to get into that fourth or third spot, depending how the SEC unfolds. The SEC has a two-loss team or a three-loss team to win the title. Then you can see Texas slipping in in that fourth spot and USC in that third spot. And then you have Ohio State, Clemson, USC, Texas for your playoff matchup. Yeah, fair point, Trevor. Like, if you look at the schedule, USC doesn't have that breathing room. And like Jordan mentioned, it's a double-edged sword. If they lose to Alabama, that might be it for their season because can you really expect this team to go undefeated in the rest of their schedule? We saw what happened to Oregon last year. Oregon lost early on to Auburn and looked poised for a potential playoff run. But what ended up happening was they had the one loss they couldn't afford, which is a three-point loss to ASU. And all of a sudden – they were a two-loss Pac-12 champion, which just wasn't enough to propel them to the playoffs. They didn't have the resume. They lost to an SEC team early in the year, which created no breathing room to really lose again. And that's what they did, lost again. 
I could really see the same thing for USC. USC, a couple um, years ago, they lost to Washington State early on in the year. And then right after that, they got the loss they couldn't afford to get that second loss. Two loss, Pac-12 champion, you're out. You're, you're really not in the top five, even let alone the top four. So I, I can totally understand that point. Now, what you're saying about two loss SEC champions, hey, guys, remember, uh, a couple years ago in 2017, Auburn almost went to the playoffs with two losses. What happened was they had faced off against Georgia, ended up getting a third loss in that championship game. But had Auburn won the SEC against wins with with wins against Alabama and Georgia, they would have gone into the playoffs as a two loss SEC champ. But you got to look at that season, Stephen. Like Alabama was like within like one at the time. Georgia was three when they played them. So it was like a no brainer. If you didn't put them in, there's something wrong with you in that sense. Like how can you leave someone who beat like the top two teams within two, a two week span? And that's what you got to do in the playoffs. So it's like, you got to put Auburn in if they ended up winning it. So we'll just have to look at how powerful that SEC bias is going to be going forward because a two loss SEC champion into the playoffs is definitely a possible resolution. Yeah. All hey, right. Hey, Steven, before we move on, I just have a question for Jordan. Jordan, you're an Oregon State alum. How do you think your Beavers are going to do this upcoming year? You know, they, they definitely had a bounce back year this past year. And I think they're going to build on that. You know, we haven't had much success at all in the past decade regarding football. So I think they're going to be rejuvenated and I think they're going to come back with definitely more, more effort than they have been these past few years. You know, I know um, when I was up there, you can kind of get the vibe from the team, just from the way the players uh, interact with people and what they do throughout the day. And from what I've heard from the people who are up there that I know, the players are a little bit different this year in terms of how they approached um, their training and their schoolwork and the vibe with the team. So I really hope they do well. It would be really good to see them succeed for at least the early part of the season. I know I think it, their schedule gets a little bit murky towards the end of the year. So hoping for good things. You know, I could totally picture the scenario where like USC loses to Alabama and like wins out everything. Uh, and they're like poised for a playoff run, and they end up getting upset by Oregon State and knocked yeah. out of the playoffs. Yeah, that's what we want. <laughs> it's like such a USC thing to happen. I mean, they're just like a blooper of a franchise right now. Like USC in college is almost like the Dallas Cowboys in the NFL. They always find a way to mess up. I agree. I agree. <laughs> he, Isaiah's got a loss for words. He can't even refute that. Um, so we're going to dive into our next topic. Before we do, I want to let you guys know about the results um, of the last poll. 67% of people said that the Lakers were the best team this season. So uh, when play resumes, we really hope, you know, LeBron and the Lakers, that you guys win that title and win it for Kobe and tie the great city of Boston. Because God knows Boston has already had enough winning to last like three lifetimes. Yeah, one more. One more for LA <laughs> Please. One more, exactly. Although with Isaiah's crazy theory about Boston, like somehow like starting the thing to eliminate LA from winning that 17th title, it'd be so funny if they resume the champion, resume the season, and Boston ends up beating LA in the finals. Oh, it'd be like a typical <laughs> Isaiah thing to happen. Oh no. <laughs> All right. While we ponder that kind of sad thought right there, let's move into our NFL topic here which I created a poll for as well. So be sure to vote, guys. Who's the better tight end, George Kittle or Travis Kelsey? Ooh, that's tough. Um, for me, I'm going to go with George Kittle because if you look at what a definition of a tight end is, is you have to be able to catch the ball and you have to be able to block. And, you know, when, you, and when it comes to catching – both Travis Kelsey and George Kittle's stats are similar. So what is the tiebreaker? The tiebreaker is how well can you block? And George Kittle is a far better blocker than 
Travis Kelsey is. That's why I'm going to give it to uh, George Kittle as the best tight end right now in football. Yeah, that's a valid discussion there. I mean, that's a really good point. Like, if you're looking at all-around tight ends, no doubt George Kittle has shown the better opportunity to be able to block and pass catch at an elite rate. But I feel like you have to look at this in a two-pronged approach and in the sense that it's really not necessary to be the best all-around player than to be the best player. This is a classic logical fallacy among sports fans, which they always assume that whoever is the best, like say you rate four categories out of 10, right? Say like blocking is one and catching is like one, right? And, and then like, if you're nine out of 10 in both, you're better than the guy who's like 10 out of 10 in one and seven out of 10 in the other, right? That would be like a logical fallacy because I think that in sports, first of all, the categories are not necessarily rated the same. You could argue that pass catching, now that NFL is such an offensive heavy sport, and such a pass heavy sport is the more important skill than blocking. So you can't really p- apply the same 50, 50% weight to it. And then I'll give you like another sports analogy. A lot of people use the argument that LeBron James is a better all around player than Jordan. Um, so therefore he's a better player. That is not necessarily true. He might be better in terms of rebounds and assists, right? But Jordan could be so much better at scoring that it cancels out that advantage. It's not like every single category is one point and they're all weighted equally. Like a player could be very, very specialized in one category and they could be the best of all time. They don't have to do everything. That's, that's, that, that's why you have roles within a team. You have roles within a sport, right? So I just think that the all around player argument is so overused, so overrated. And now I'm going to apply it to this specific circumstance. I think Kittle is just, by and far, the more consistent pass catcher, the better receiver than George Kittle. And that matters more. Travis Kelsey, that matters more in today's game, pass catching. So I'm going to give it to Kelsey. And the other thing is a lot of people want to bring up the fact that, well, Kelsey only had better receiving yardage in the playoffs and in the regular season because of his system. Well, first of all, you know, the system of the Chiefs being pass heavy, that means that he also has more targets to compete with, like in Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is clearly a far superior receiving talent than Debo Samuel. And yet he was still made such a strong impact at an a thousand yard receiving five consecutive years with the chiefs. And, you know, if you're going to argue that Kittle missed the opportunity to catch a lot of yardage, I could say the same about Kelsey and blocking. He wasn't in a block heavy scheme. So was he really able to demonstrate his full blocking ability on a chiefs team that is heavily pass heavy and basically puts the tight ends as extensions of wide receivers. So it really goes both ways. You got to look at this argument in both ways. And I think when you examine all the factors with the championship pedigree and the consistency in the playoffs, I have to give this to Kelsey very clearly who's the better tight end. Yeah, I would, I would definitely, well, I wouldn't say definitely, but I would think I would have to agree with that as well. I think, um, you know, Kittle is a great player, but, I think he's also a product of the scheming that's involved with San Fran, you know, with the way that they run out of that formation, all their plays look very similar to each other. And in turn, Kittle is allowed to break free just from the way they scheme their run plays and their play actions. But uh, Kelsey, on the other hand, although he's in a different offense, the dude's been doing it for a very long time. And people know how good he is, and yet he's still able to produce the way he's been producing. And I think with the way the, ga- the game has been going, like Steven said, it would be, it would be, um, it wouldn't be true to say that Kittle is more valuable right now in a way because of the fact that the game is being turned to more of a passing flow. And um, but I think, I think Kelsey is going to have to be the, the better option right now. But I think Patrick Mahomes plays a big role in that as well. I think if Kittle was switched with um, Kelsey, I think the Chiefs might, who knows, they might be even better in a way. <laughs> you never yeah, know. Yeah, but, but, but Jordan, then Kittle wouldn't be the better blocker anymore, would he? 
Right, because he's not going right. to be in that type of scheme where he's involved in blocking as much, right? So Yeah, so if you're going to use that argument for pass catching, right, you got to look at it in terms of blocking. Kelsey is not a terrible blocker either. Mm-hmm. It's not like he doesn't have that in his repertoire. If you put him in the Niners system, he's going to block the hell out of a Vikings defensive lineman or a Seattle Seahawks defensive lineman if necessary. Like mm-hmm. It's not like he doesn't have in his repertoire. I'm going to go to Trevor now. Like, as I start to look at this debate more and more, yes, I will go with Travis Kelsey, but, like, wow, because, like, he he has more targets. He's more consistent. It felt like he was your go-to, your next elite tight end. When the game is on the line, who do you throw to? Travis Kelsey, he's going to catch it. He's, like, your tight end in that sense. So it's, like, when you have those type of tight ends, you think of Tony Gonzalez, Gronk, Antonio Gates, you think of those tight ends because they were able to do that when the game was on the line. And then Kettle just felt like any ordinary tight end. He blocked really well, but he like their offense just didn't use him right. It felt like Jimmy Graham, when he was on the Seattle Seahawks, they didn't use him properly, but he was like great tight end in Green Bay. So you just like saying how the system of plays and you got to look at if it's a, a definitely a running back heavy team, they're not going to really rely on their tight end as much. So that's going to affect on how you value that player. But besides, if you take away that, looking at their catching capabilities, you would just rely more on Travis Kelsey because he just can make plays. And when things get a little scary or down to the wire, I would rely on Travis Kelsey more than Kettle. Yeah, man, if Kittle were so good, the Niners would have won the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> Head to head against the Chiefs, by the way, the other guy on the other field, Travis Kelsey. Because like, if they would use the tight end, it'd be like Tom Brady using Gronk. Like, look at the when the Patriots play the Eagles. When the Patriots are down and trying to need a quick score, who did they go to on the entire drive? Gronk. And the 49ers did not do that with Kettle. And I think one people people are really forgetting is that the Patriots were not always a pass-heavy scheme. They were a run-heavy scheme at the beginning of Brady's career. Gronk was able to be so good that he gave the Patriots a reason to become pass-heavy. If you're really that great of a tight end, you're going to give the offense a reason to adjust and become more pass-heavy. With the Niners, they're still mostly a run-heavy team. That tells you that Kittle might not be a revolutionary and game-changing tight end. No, I, but I wouldn't I put most of I wouldn't put most of that on Kittle, like like that fault on Kittle. I would put it more on the reason why the Niners are a run heavy team is because I don't really think Shanahan believes in Jimmy Garoppolo that much. Exactly, man. He he's not a top ten quarterback like Kirk Cousins who can make the amazing throw <laughs> down the middle to Adam Thielen to end the game in overtime. But I would like to also add, if you're looking, saying that the 49ers were a run-heavy team, look at the Chargers in the early 2000s with LaDainian Tomlinson, Antonio Gates, and that squad. They were still able to use Antonio Gates effectively and still have a dominant running back who ended up winning a couple rushing titles. So it's like it is possible to use a tight end to a very effective scheme if you want it to. Yeah, and Kittle's an amazing pass catcher. Don't get me wrong. I just think Kelsey has him edged a little bit i think it's also worth noting that um kiddo i think i i think kiddo is ranked the number one player by pff you know that pro football focus and i think that's a lot of advanced stats and them diving into how much value plays into the player's ranking i think it's also worth noting. all right so let's get into our next topic here which is which quarterback taken in 2018 to 2019 has the potential to have that signature breakout season? Um, I'm talking about like that Cam Newton type of season, Colin Kaepernick type of season. And we got a multitude of quarterbacks to choose from here. From 2018 class, we have Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, and Lamar Jackson. From 2019, we got Kyler Murray, Daniel Jones, Dwayne Haskins, Drew Locke, and Jarrett Stidham. So, I think I'm going to start with you. Who do you think out of this list has the potential, has the greatest potential to have that breakout season? Ooh. Um, I am going – look. well, actually looking at this list, 
I'm going to go with Drew Locke from the Denver Broncos. The reason being is that when he came in in relief of Joe Flacco and Brandon Allen for the Broncos, the final five games of the season that he started, he brought confidence, swagger, and juice to the Denver Broncos. Uh, if you guys need some evidence, just look at his uh, amazing rapping video that he did on the sideline. But yeah, he he made the Broncos fun to watch again. You know, they were four and one when he started. He was uh, he completed a hundred passes for a hundred fifty six. Uh, 64.1% completion percentage, 1,020 yards passing, seven touchdowns, three interceptions. And this, like all, like what, what Drew Locke did was he did this with not the very best of weapons. You know, he had Noah Fant, Cortland Sutton, but that was pretty much it because Emmanuel Sanders, he was traded to San Francisco midseason. Now the Broncos during this draft and this offseason, they went out and they got him weapons and protection. Graham Glasgow, whom they signed from the Detroit Lions to protect Drew Locke. And then they in the draft, they got Jerry Judy, best receiver in the draft, and K.J. Hamler from Penn State. Drew Locke, I think, is going to have a great year this year. I think he's going to break out. And I believe he's going to lead the Broncos to the playoffs because with that offense <laughs> – Fangio molding that defense, that defensive genius that he is. Watch out for the Broncos, ladies and gentlemen. Just watch out for the Broncos. All right, we got kind of a hot take here. Um, I I would have to go with um, either Baker Mayfield or Kyler Murray. I'm going to go with Kyler Murray here. Uh, I think, you know, him being more of a team locker room leader, not as divisive as, as Baker Mayfield. And then how the Cardinals just poached DeAndre Hopkins – basically giving up like not that much and then under the leadership of a cliff kingsbury i think that cardinals offense really has the potential to explode this season and the team could really win the division this year um look out for the cardinals this is a team that's like poised to break out in a much similar fashion as the la rams did a couple years ago with jared goff from out of the playoffs to like all the way to the super bowl so i think kyler murray I'm going to go with Kyler Murray. Uh, I think yeah, you're going to laugh, but I think I'm, I'm going to have to say Lamar. Just, I, <laughs> I know, guy. I know that um, he had one of the most incredible years ever and it's going to be hard to top that. But I think with Greg Roman coming back, their offensive coordinator, that's really going to help his development. I also think that, you know, Marquise Brown, can be a bona fide wide receiver one for a team in the near future. I think a year ago, he said he was playing at 155 pounds. He's jacked up to 175. Now he can take more of a more hits. Uh, our defense is upgraded as well. We got Patrick queen from the draft. We got JK Dobbins as a backup running back. We also picked up the lineman from Seattle to Yonda, who retired. You know, so I think the reason why I'm bringing this up is I think team success is going to play a lot into how well these quarterbacks do this upcoming year. And I think out of all the teams that were laid out, the uh, the three quarterbacks that are going to benefit the most from it are Lamar, Kyler Murray, and probably Baker Mayfield. But I, I got to go with Lamar just in terms of talent because I don't think anyone can stop him from running. I mean, the man is transcendent the way he jukes and the way he's able to read defenses just i've never seen anything like it and until i see him go downhill i'm gonna go, have to go with my man action jackson hmm, lamar action jackson i like it the only reason i didn't have lamar jackson who i think out of these quarterbacks is going to have the best season is because he was already so transcendent last year that really like the only thing he can do to improve on his season last year is to either like put up even more insane numbers, which obviously could happen, but really the biggest way would be to win the Super Bowl. And while I think winning the Super Bowl would definitely constitute like, like a breakout season for Lamar Jackson, the Ravens, I just like, I don't see it as like that far away from him. I don't see it as a vast improvement from where he is now. I think he's got room to improve but not quite amount, the amount of room to improve that Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray do. 
And then the other dudes on this list, which are like Sam Darnold and Josh Allen, I just don't think they have the offensive infrastructure to really succeed at the highest level just yet. I'm going to go to Trevor now. I, I am torn between Lamar Jackson and Baker Mayfield. Ooh. But Lamar Jackson, I feel like, is the incarnation of, Cam, of the Super Cam and how he had a dominant season before he got to the Super Bowl. And then the next season after, he's MVP, leads the Panthers to the Super Bowl, has crazy stat numbers. Even though he loses that game, Like I feel like that's where Lamar Jackson is headed. And that's how I feel like what his season is going to be like next year, if possible. But for the biggest improvement, the biggest leap, I think would be Baker Mayfield is getting the Cleveland Browns to the playoffs. And if even possible, slipping into that AFC championship game, that might be a stretch based on how many new pieces that they've added. But like now they've nailed down the receiving core. He has people to rely on. The They beefed up the offense. It is possible that the Browns could have a team that wins wild card weekend, beats the divisional round, or at least struggle in the divisional round because, you know, those teams in the division round are ready and be able – they're playoff contending teams at that point. There's no – any mistakes that those teams have. And if you make those mistakes, you're going to lose. So I think – Baker Mayfield has like the greatest chances of doing well in the playoffs, but he hasn't had that playoff experience to make something magical happen out of it. Yeah, I think there's still some ways to go for Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. And that's the main point of my segment here. I'm really looking at the combination of who has the most room to improve and who has the resources to improve that much. I look at guys like Lamar Jackson and, you know, how much more can you really ask the dude to improve? Yeah, he can be a better passer. Yeah, he can go like 16-0 and 0 or something and win the Super Bowl, right? But all of that, I mean, it'd still be like marginal improvements from how amazing he already is. He's just already so amazing. And then I look at guys like Sam Darnold, just doesn't have the necessary infrastructure to improve. And Isaiah, I know like you love Drew Locke. Um, I don't think he has the ability yet. You still got some time to mature. For me, like, I don't know. I think NFL Network did kind of a poor job on this list because why would you even put Lamar Jackson on this list? I get it that he was drafted in the 2018 draft class, but Lamar Jackson has already broken out big time. Like, what more do you want the guy to do? (laughs) Is a breakout for him considered winning a Super Bowl? Like, that's, exactly. that's the only thing I don't really get from this uh, list. All right, let's dive into our last topic right here. And we got the poll up, guys. Who would win one-on-one? By the way, in their prime. I'm not talking about, like, right now. Obviously, Katie would cook MJ. But who would win one-on-one? Michael Jordan versus Kevin Durant. But before I get into that question, our special guest here today, Jordan, is an avid KD fan. He like models his game after Katie thinks Katie's a really special offensive talent. And Jordan, like, why don't you talk to us about like what makes you respect Kevin Durant so much? I I mean, he's legitimately a seven foot definition of basketball right now in terms of what he can do offensively. The man, he he's so big that apparently when he goes up for his jump shot, his hands are over 10 feet high. So you're pretty much going for a dunk every time you try to block your shot. Just keep that in mind. Not only can he do everything, but he's especially good at posting up. So in terms of stopping him, you really can't because the man can attack facing you, facing away from the basket. He can drive, he can pull up, he can shoot from three. He's pretty much our generation's Kareem in a sense because yeah because the game's changing right like I love that his his one foot I mean Dirk did it but I feel like Katie mastered it in this in the new sense of the game because Dirk did a lot of his off post-ups and spins but Katie does his off the dribble or I know it's just I I've never seen anything like it. And so in terms of greatest offensive player ever, to me, he is. 
I don't know how you can really make an argument for anyone else now that the game is evolving to involve more shooting, you know, on offense. Yeah, to me, Kevin Durant is the most talented offensive weapon since Kareem because this era is all about space and pace and it's about being versatile, not just posting up, not just driving in, but the combination of posting up, driving in, shooting threes, being able to pass the ball, everything. Kevin Durant has all of that. He can really score from any position of the court and he does it so smoothly. Like I look at a guy like Giannis. Yeah, the numbers are very, very LeBron-like and KD-like. Like you could argue he has better numbers than Kevin Durant, but just the like visualization of the game, he's not as smooth as Kevin Durant. He's a lot choppier. Mm-hmm. His game, it's not as beautiful. And like when he shoots the shot, man, I'm like, is that me shooting out there on the court? Like at seven foot two? Because the shot form does not look beautiful at all. And I think Durant really has all the fundamentals to go out there and average the most points per game in the league and to like surpass LeBron and Kareem in all time scoring. It's just really about like how much longer he wants to go at it and how badly he wants it on a game to game basis. Sort of that killer instinct. Like I really hate to talk about that, but it is sort of a thing, you know, if Kevin Durant really wants to take over and dominate the game, he can do it. And he's shown that ability. And when he does it, there's no one who can do it better than him. Cause the dude is literally a seven foot, like Jamal Crawford, Dirk Nowitzki, LeBron James, hey. like hybrid, man. I mean, it, there's not much you can really do to stop him. He's got great handle. He's got a great shooting form, great art, everything. So what he, like against the Clippers, you've seen what he can do when, when he's really pushed back against his wall and then against the Cavaliers as well. So that's why I'm going to start off this segment by saying that one-on-one, and this might be controversial for some of the old fans watching out there. I think KD would cook MJ. And I'm talking, not talking about right now. I'm saying in their prime, I think Kevin Durant would win no doubt because six inches is a lot in basketball. And like, don't get at me like this whole like height doesn't matter thing. Like people will always tell me like, oh, height's overrated in basketball. And I'm like, have you ever like gone out to the park, right? And you try to play someone who's like way worse fundamentally than you, but he's got like three or four inches on you. And it's a neck and neck game. Now imagine if that dude has six inches on you. He has like 40 pounds on you. That's not some small proposition you can just shrug off. Like the dude can literally look at MJ in the eye and shoot over him. Because his vertical is about the same. His speed's a little bit slower, maybe. Strength is a little bit less, but he's way taller. He can shoot over the dude, for goodness sake. He would crush MJ one-on-one. Yeah, playing playing style plays a big part. Because when you look at – if we're saying in a game of one-on-one, MJ's game was towards his later years, from what we've been seeing on the last dance, it it involved the fadeaway quite a bit. And (laughs) – like, I don't know if you're going to be able to get that fadeaway off yeah. every time on KD. Because eventually, yeah. you everyone here has played basketball for a little bit, right? Eventually, yep. you play someone one-on-one enough, you get their timing. And you pick up their tendencies. And then you know what, what they like to do. So, KD might know, hey, Michael might pull up here. He's going to be ready for it. And at the end of the day, like Steven said just one inch makes a big difference but one inch katie has more than that and so he's able to give more space on defense and be able to close out in a quicker manner than mj would if he was playing defense on kd and i just think biomechanically and like as we're how humans move it's just too much for michael to go against every single possession because at some point something's going to give people are going to figure out how to play each other. And I love how you bring that sports psychology segment to it. Humans are highly adaptive, right? If you cross me up one time with the same move, you're not going to get me like five times more. And we're playing to a game of 21 losers ball, right? Like you keep fading away the same way down the right block, right? If I'm seven foot and you're six foot six, right? All that is, is I got to time it and I got to develop that rhythm and I'm blocking your shot easily. And that's the thing. The players are going to adapt to each other's style of play when you're playing to a point total like that. And Durant is going to find a way to really contain Jordan. 
I'm going to actually bring a historical analogy to this, man. It's like if you're trying to catapult over the Great Wall of China, you might be able to get it the first three or four times, right? But you're not going to get that same thing nine times in a row, right? But if you're Kevin Durant, man, and you're shooting over a guy six inches short than you, I'm guaranteed to get that, that shot every time, mm -hmm. every time. Right, right. Totally agree. And just the way that he, he's just so much bigger than him. It's kind of like playing against your little cousin. Like, yeah, they might block you at some point, but they had to time everything perfectly. They probably had to guess what you were doing and they had to catch you off guard because they're probably not going to do it more than one time. And they have to do it without foul too. Right, right. Because we're going to call, they're going to call fouls on the one-on-one. So I just think KD just has more cards to play with than Michael on the one-on-one game. All right, we're going to go to Trevor and Isaiah. Trevor, you can go ahead. All right, when I look at this, yes, KD has the range, the height, but the thing that's probably going to boil down to, like, the earlier stages, I think Michael Jordan's going to be more physical because, like, when he was in his prime, he had to deal with a lot of physical teams. He had to deal with the bad boys from big men roughing him up, almost punching him in the face, and I think he would probably do the same thing to KD early on, and that would mess up his game early on, but I think KD would probably find a way to end up closing out in that sense. He would just be able to adapt to it, but like really if you look at KD in his prime, he didn't really have too many physical matchups that he had to hunker down and just say I'm locked on this person one-to-one. -one. It's going to be a hard contest, fought battle. He didn't really have to deal with that. And he, he didn't really drive in too much. He really sat in the perimeter and shot deep twos and deep threes, so for him to really drive in, it would be like he can, but he's not going to try to cross up Michael Jordan. It just wouldn't make sense because it's like he has a lot of time and Michael Jordan's closer to the ball, so you can easily steal it from him. So he's going to probably stick out to the outside shot most of the time. All right, Isaiah. Yeah. For, for me, um, Steven, you said it earlier where, you know, uh, you, you were trying to say like how LeBron – like Mike, uh, if LeBron and Michael Jordan played one on one, uh, LeBron, didn't you say like you were like kind of scared to say like how that matchup would unfold or something like that? Well, I'm gonna say it. LeBron James would absolutely crush Michael Jordan because LeBron James is like. 50 pounds heavier than Michael Jordan. He'll just back him down in the post and then just shoot the layup. Um, but as far as KD, I believe, yeah, I believe the same thing would happen uh, with KD against MJ. I think that the, the height of Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant is like a seven footer. Michael Jordan's like six, five, six, six inch. So KD pretty much has like a four to five inch advantage against him. And I don't think Michael Jordan would be as effective offensively against KD because of KD's long arms and long wingspan and his height. So, yeah, that's why I'm going to go with KD over Jordan. Yeah, I mean, and this is all under the assumption when I say KD getting that shot, that he's not going to drive in and take those contact layups that a lot of NBA players lo love. The, the bottom line is, is that KD is going to have so much in his repertoire. But the one constant is he's always going to have basically an open shot because of that height advantage every yeah. time. So like, you know, if he, if he's unsuccessful driving in, if he's unsuccessful, you know, fading away, he can just rise up and shoot it over Jordan. And that's really the power of being taller and almost as athletic as the person you're facing. Cause this is not well, like some drastic athletic difference. Like, I know people are going to say that Jordan scored against guys like much bigger and taller than him in the nineties, but like Katie is the first of his kind who has that size and that level of athleticism all put into one, like Carl Malone and Shaq and all these other guys, um, Sean Kemp, they don't have the height and the athleticism that Durant has. Well, this is assuming that we're playing under today's rules, right? Because if no, we're, we're literally just through... playing a one-on-one -on -one game, dude. It's not about today or yesterday's rules. Just a twenty-one losers ball. I think it would be close. I think it would be a. It might be a different story though if, like, we're playing under '80s rules with 
like extreme physical play. You can close line people and all that stuff. <laughs> but yeah, I got KD. Like if it's today's roof, definitely. All right, I'm gonna go with KD, uh, 21 to 14. Give us a score prediction. I'm gonna go KD, 21 to 11. I think I got KD 21 to 19 because I think MJ is going to go psycho mode and he don't want to lose. Oh, yeah. All right, Trevor. I'm going to have to agree with Jordan on that one with that score. I can see Jordan doing some some weird berserker stuff through. He has that. He has a heart of a champion winning six rings and then going back to back in multiple of those. It's really hard to say to that because like KD really haven't had that experience by like when you look at him on the Warriors he had players to help him if he didn't have anything going like the only thing that you can say that it was him doing most of the work when when he was in OKC but like even still he had Russell to give him the ball to give him that open shot so Jordan had to create stuff so I, that's why I'm thinking with Jordan score it's going to be like 1921 but KD's going to pull out like a deep range three to end up winning the game I love it, man. Katie with that signature final shot. This time over another great MJ. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us, guys. Hey, Thank Steven, you so much Steven, for coming on, Steven. Jordan. Before um, before we wrap it up, um, make sure you guys tune in uh, in like a couple of days. We will be dropping some really epic news regarding a future episode of Quarantine Chat. All right. And we're going to leave you guys with some high hopes. Mama said, fulfill the prophecy, be something great, go make a legacy, manifest destiny, back in the days we wanted everything, wanted everything. Mama said, burn your biographies, rewrite your history, light up your wildest dreams, museum victories, every day we wanted everything, wanted everything. Mama said.